be to God. Wow, the pastor's wife laying it on heavy. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Tracy. And I, I understood what the, the, why she felt the need to give the caveat there. Paul's words, walk by the spirit and do not gratify the, the desires of the flesh. Um, Apostle Paul to an early Christian community who apparently, despite their proximity in time to the resurrection of Christ, had their issues. They had their issues such that Paul had to encourage them towards love instead of hatred, um, towards self-control instead of debauchery and orgies. Come on, you all, he says, walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. So this little scriptural phrase, though, has been interpreted problematically, though it seems, because it seems to condemn all things body, when in, but, but when in fact that's not what Paul meant. We've got to remember that Paul was a Jew, not a Greek, and for the Jewish world, creation and the body, just as, as Jake made it clear from Genesis is, was pronounced good. God pro, uh, pronounced God's love for creation, including the body. It was only certain Greek philosophies that set up this dualism between immaterial spirit as good and holy and material body at, and earthly creation as corrupt and unholy. Paul was weaned on Genesis and that, or, that mythic origin story where God created the earth and, and, and pronounced it good and worth saving, not bad and in need of being shed. And yet Paul makes such a proclamation um, about walking by the Spirit and not satisfying the desires of the flesh that it's easy to, to hear it as spirit good, body bad. But for Paul, the flesh is not equivalent to the material body, nor the spirit equivalent to immaterial personality or soul. Rather, the distinction is between human life, body, spirit, personality, and soul, marked by love and generativity and flourishing, which would be the human walking by the spirit, contrasted with human life, body, spirit, personality, soul, marked by decay, diminishment, hostility, and death. All those examples that, that um, Tracy read Paul giving, which seem to emphasize in particular sexual sinfulness, right? The desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh that Paul refers to is human embodied life distorted by sin, which came into the world through Adam and Eve's turning away from God, as the story of the fall describes, with contrasted with the spirit life, which is the embodied lived life within the original intention of God's creation and, and beloved world, and specifically revealed in, for, for us in Jesus Christ through his life, teachings, passion, death, and resurrection. So our bodies, our sexuality, our, and, and sex itself, despite what the church has seemed to suggest over the centuries, is not a sinful, dirty, fleshy thing that was the result of our fall from grace, but rather our bodies, our sexuality is, into, is an integral aspect of our God-created selves, which, like all human existence, is marred by the sinful, broken, suffering nature of this world, but also participating in the renewed, renewing, flourishing nature that God is bringing to be through the resurrected Christ. So, okay, hopefully you get, you, you get the distinction there that I'm trying to help make between what Paul is saying between flesh and spirit. It can sound like abstract Christian theology at times, but, but as Paul, which Paul is good at, at doing, getting really abstract, but he also gets really practical and really personal too. 
many thought and still think way too personal. But we all know the truth of what Paul is talking about when sexuality is full of spirit, meaning it's grounded in goodness and, and joy and generates mutual honoring and care and uplift between ourselves and others. And we know when sexual expression is harmful and violent and diminishing to ourselves and others. And Paul is trying to be crystal clear with his listeners about what their lives should look like under the influence of the Holy Spirit, contrasted with still being under the sway of the flesh, as he calls it. And from then to the very present day, it's one of the things that the church has struggled with to name, support, and encourage healthy human sexuality, and to name and discourage unhealthy human sexuality. Fair enough that the church seeks to point to it. It's, it's good and it's central to who we are and, and fair to distinguish because of the inherent problems therein and the way we can get so off track within our, our sexual expressions of ourselves. But there's also, it has also caused problems to, to, you know, to say the least. And I'll just mention one since we are here in Pride Month and we are an open and affirming congregation with a gay pride flag hanging from the front doors of our church. The Christian church has unfortunately fallen into another kind of dualistic trap where, where it has too simplistically conflated sinful human sexuality with sexual orientation and gender identity, such that healthy human sexuality, healthy human sexuality has been associated exclusively with the dominant majority group of power holders in our society, right? This, I would suggest, is more a matter of, of con convenience and self-justification than authentic Christian theology, because it takes the focus off of how we all sin and fall short of the glory of God in our gendered sexual lives, and it scapegoats a particular group of people as the problem letting us of the normative dominant group off the hook. Shame on us. Christian theology makes clear and obvious that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and it's exactly all of us that Christ died for. So come on, there are ways of being in heterosexual and homosexual relationships that fall into Paul's flesh categories, meaning they are marked by diminishment and violence and alienation. And there are ways of being in relationship with one another, homo or hetero, that is walking by the spirit, meaning it's mutually beneficial, life enhancing and generative. Likewise, the human being, whether male, female, or non-binary, is marred by sin, but also so loved by God that God was willing to die for that love. We all stand on that same ground, all of us sinners, all of us forgiven, all of us created physical embodied beings, weighted, fallen by how God's good creation has been distorted, and all of us invited to rise and walk by the Spirit in how God's good creation is being transformed. Amen? Amen. So now that we've cleared that up, let's return to Paul's lists here. I'm not just going to leave that to Tracy to, to lay out to you, but we're going to review these a little bit closer. Um, just quickly, and just and and here again, how he describes the fleshly sin, fleshly sinful life, and the spirit godly life, and how we might lean into the spirit godly life. I don't think many of us would take issue with his categories that he lays out. Let us walk by the spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh, which are, he says, sexual immorality and debauchery. 
That's a good, good word, debauchery. <laughs> Means excessive indulgence. Desires of the flesh. It's idolatry. What are our idols these days that we tend to bow our knee to more than God? It's a good question. Sorcery. Or you could say, be careful of the energy you send out to others that curses them and does not bless them. It's hatred, discord, jealousy, and rage. Yeah, I think we are with Paul on these being problematic. It's rivalries, divisions, and factions. Those are good ones for our day. It's envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I don't know what the like is because I think he kind of covers the bases with all of these, but, but uh, it's those things that Paul says are the unredeemed desires of the flesh that diminish our lives instead of, um, instead of allowing them to flourish. And then he lays out what kinds of qualities mark a human life walking by the Spirit, he says. And at the start of that list, he refers to them as the fruits of the, of the Spirit, which is a great analogy, right? Especially for this time, those of you who have, have gardens can appreciate this. When we plant trees and plants to get fruit, we don't make the fruit ourselves, but we cultivate the garden to allow the fruit to come. So the question is not how to make these things happen in our lives, these fruits of the spirit, but how do we cultivate the soil of ourselves so that these beautiful things can arise and bloom in our lives? And then he lists the fruit of the spirit. Love, of course, love. Joy and peace, right? They can abide no matter our outward circumstances. Patience. Mm. Any of us been feeling impatient lately? No. Patience. Kindness and goodness. Right? We can always use more of that fruit in our lives. How many of us here have stories of kindness and goodness over these last few days? I bet you we all do at some level or another. How do we lean into that faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Agreed. All things this world could use more of these, these days. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. But one thing that, I, that Paul would remind you that I want to end on, and that is this. We are cultivating the garden of our souls and trying to weed out the weeds and keep away the critters that will destroy the fruits of the Spirit. We're, we're, we're seeking to do that for our world's sake and for our sake and, for, and to serve God and how God asks us to serve. And God in the world needs us to work on that, to lean into the walk of the Spirit and to curb the desires of the flesh. But as a, as a, Prot as a Protestant church, we need to be really clear, Protestant, you know, coming right out of the Reformers, we need to be really clear that cultivating the fruit of the Spirit is not about earning God's love or jewels in our crown or access to heaven. God's love is freely and fully given to all of us forever, even if we are full of envy and resentment and discord and live lives of debauchery. God loves us. And the scandal of it all, for many of us, the scandal of it is that God's love is not given anymore to those who are filled with peace, joy, kindness, and love. Such qualities simply have their own reward. God loves the haters and the lovers alike, the drunkards and the teetotalers, the petty and the gracious, the impure 
as well as the pure. And that love was offered forever more on the cross and spread out to the world from the empty tomb in the fleshly body of the resurrected Christ. Amen.